Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children, and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, and when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates. There's this show on NBC. I'm sure a lot of you have uh, heard of it before. If not, it's, it's called the, the American Ninja Warrior. The, 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 it's called the American Ninja Warrior. It's on NBC. It's probably in about its eighth or ninth season, I think so. But this show, what happens is, is contestants from all over the United States, uh, they come together uh, with one goal in mind. They want to be the next uh, American Ninja Warrior. And they go through all these obstacle courses, and the obstacle courses um, uh, get harder and harder as they move on uh, to the next level. At first, there's hundreds, and, it, and, it's, and it's dwindled down. Some of these are so uh, devoted to uh, this task, to this this goal that they're obsessed with, they have in their homes. A lot of them have made uh, um, replicas of these obstacle courses so that they can train. They they are very uh, single minded and, and focused on uh, on being that that, that uh, American ninja warrior. In the qualifying round, um, it's set up so that. Uh, there's only 30 people that make it uh, to, to Vegas. That's the next round. That's, and, and these 30 people, they have to not only have the fastest time, but they have to make it through the course. If, if you fall or you mess up on an obstacle, there's a big pool to catch you, and, and, and once you're done, you're out. And you can see some of these people, they're devastated because they put so much into this. They've been so focused on it that uh, they're devastated. And not only uh, do you have to make it through, but you've got to have one of the 30 best times in order to qualify for the next round. Just like uh, these athletes, these great athletes, have this single goal. We, too, have a, a sole uh, goal. We have a, a single goal, not only as Christians, but really every human being on the face of this earth, past, present, and future, have one goal, whether they realize it or not. This goal demands the same single-mindedness that these athletes dedicate themselves to. And so that's our, uh, that's our topic this morning. We are in chapter 14 of the Believe series. And uh, remember, the first 10 chapters were, what do we believe? And now it's like, what do we do with that? What, what, what do we do? And this week, we're talking about single-mindedness. That's our topic. And I encourage you, as I do every week, to, to uh, follow along, to get into this thing. And it's, it's not a... a, a an orderly, it's not like the story, you know, where you may lose something of what happened in the past. They're topic by topic, so if you hadn't been in at this point, jump in at, at chapter 14, chapter 15 uh, next week. My brother, uh, one of my brothers contacted me this week and, and left me a, a voicemail. He visited our church uh, not too long ago when I handed him one of those Believe books, and uh, he left me a voicemail saying, uh, I just want to thank you for that, that believe book. <laughs> I struggle in my, in my Bible reading, and this is so simple and, and, and uh, helps me to understand the Bible even more. And so I encourage you to get into it. There's some exciting stuff uh, going on here, and it's, and it's topic by topic. This week, we're talking about single-mindedness. Single-mindedness, having or showing a, a single aim or purpose it's being dedicated to something. It's, it's a resolute. It's, it's, it's steadfastness. It's a determination. And this is the attitude that God, as we heard in that passage that Joel read to us out of Deuteronomy, this is the attitude that God called the, the nation of Israel to have as his people. He called them out of Egypt. They're in the wilderness, and he is forming 
right? He is about to form his people. He's about to take them into, a prom, into the promised land. And they are going to be his people, his nation, uh, his light unto the world, the people that would worship him. And this is what he's telling Israel that I require of you. It's the same resolve that he calls us as New Testament Christians, as his children, as followers of Jesus to have as well. He says to Israel, he says, the Lord, your God, the Lord is one. And in saying this, he's not just saying that, that uh, there is only one God, though it certainly entails that, right? It entails that, that I am Yahweh, I am the great I am, I am the first and the last, there is no other God, all these gods of these other nations, they don't exist, they're not real. But when he says that the Lord is one, he is talking about that goal. He is saying, I am your devotion. I am your purpose. The Lord your God is one. I am the single um, uh, mission. You shall worship. You shall have no other gods, false or otherwise, before me. He, he, he's telling us, he says that your goal isn't your vo vocation, it's not your career. It's not even your ministry. It's not your legacy, though that's a wonderful thing. How wonderful it is to, to leave a great legacy, especially a godly legacy behind, but that's not our goal. It's not our retirement. It's not your bucket list. <laughs> before you die, your mission isn't to check off your, your bucket list before you go and be with the Lord. <clears throat> Your goal is single, and your goal is God himself alone. That is the goal of every believer. That's why Jesus says, he tells his disciples, he says, you cannot serve God and manna. He says, you cannot serve uh, God and, and, and money. And he talks about money, and not that money is, is evil itself, but that money is the root of all kinds of evil. Money is a gift from God just like everything else. But it has, it has a magnetic power that can draw you to it, much like other things can, that you can be devoted to it. We've talked about in the past, you don't have to be rich to be devoted to money. You just have to be obsessed. Your life has to be obsessed with money, keeping up with the Joneses, even making ends meet. Anything that pulls us away from, from, from God. So you can't serve God in money. You can't serve God in man. A lot of us will say, well, amen to that. But our world says otherwise. Our society, our culture says otherwise. says that we do serve man. We are looking to appease man. We are looking for the approval of man. And God has created us in, in, in a certain way that we desire a, 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 a acceptance, right? But it's the perversion of that acceptance. Where everything we do in life is, is, is striving for money. Or everything we do in life is, is striving for acceptance to be loved. You've heard of the word love starved. It's starving for that attention, that, that, that affection, the Facebook likes, whatever it, it may be. You can't serve God and, and, and sex. Another great gift that God has given to to man and woman in the confines of, of marriage, something to be enjoyed, not just to reproduce, but how much of our life and, and culture is based on sex and how much do we live life with that underlying theme of, of, uh, of, of satisfying that, that, that sexual desire within us. It makes us more like animals and, and society would have us believe that we are animals and we do everything to gratify that instead of gratifying that God nature <laughs> that is within us so these things that are not God have a tendency to control us and Satan uses that to bring us away from God divided devotion takes us away from our goal God wants us to be single minded it's like having your hands in too many pots 10 years ago when uh uh i had god done a great uh work in my life i was excited 
and uh, I wanted to to uh, to do something. And, and uh, God had created a newfound desire in me to write. <laughs> I love to read now, and I and I love to write. And so I wanted to write, and I wanted to put pen to uh, paper. And so I started doing that, and I I created this little ministry called Psalm Twenty Two Ministries. And all it was was an internet devotional. I would just grab everybody's email, you know, everybody who would give me their email, and I would send out these uh, devotionals here and there. And along the way, I had this, and then other ideas started to pop up in my head. Well, what about doing this? And what about doing that? And others came to me, hey, well, why don't we do this? And why don't we do that? And man, some of them were such good ideas. But somehow God spoke to me. I don't know if it was an idea in my head or somebody else told me, but but I finally uh, realized that no, I needed to be focused on Psalm 22 ministries. <laughs> I didn't need to have my hands in all these other pots because when I did, it would take me away from that. And because I decided to just be simple and, and focus on that, it lasted a lot longer. In fact, I did Psalm 22 ministries up until the start of this, this church. And then now this is my focus. And I still like to write and I still do that. But now this is my uh, This is my focus. God wants us to be single-minded. He wants us to be devoted to Him because the Lord, our God, is one. But then God also desires our, not just our devotion, He wants our affection. Did you know that? He wants our He wants our emotions. He gave us those emotions for a, a purpose, and He wants our and desires our uh, affections. He says, "Love the Lord God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your might, Israel, with all of your strength, children of God, with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength." What does that mean? That means with everything that you've got. God wants us to be consumed with Him. He wants us to be saturated with Him, to love Him with all of our energy, with everything we have, with our minds, with our affections, and the things that we do. He wants single-mindedness from us. I was once at a, a, a gathering, and I was talking to this gentleman, and, and uh, he was asking about the church, and so I was sharing a little bit about our church and stuff, and then he went on to tell me about his church, and this guy had been a Christian for uh, a, a good while, and he was talking about the amazing things that were happening in his church. As the conversation went on, he, uh, the conversation kind of changed a little bit, and uh, there was a point, he was talking about a shirt that he wanted, he goes, you know, I want... Uh, I want one of those shirts that says, uh, I love Jesus, but I drink a little. And uh, the origin of that shirt actually comes from the Ellen uh, DeGeneres show. Uh, there's this lady that she talks to. It's actually pretty pretty hilarious. She talks to this uh, elderly lady over the phone, and they have these conversations. And the first time they talked, she said, well, I just want to tell you, I love Jesus, but I drink a little. And the whole place just was dying laughing she dropped the phone for a little bit and then she picked it up and 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 started talking with her again and so he told me this and I knew the origins and actually I didn't really think much of it because I was like yeah I mean I believe that that uh, the things in this life for the most part are gifts from God I believe that the beer and wine are uh are a gift from God to not be abused just like anything else just like money uh, money is a good thing, but it's not to be abused. Food is a good thing, but it's not to be uh, overindulged in. Those things are good. And so he said it, and I was just like, yeah, I mean, I can, I can understand that. The, that. That makes a statement about, about the gifts that, that come, uh, comes from God. But what I found out as the night went on, he was preparing me uh, for uh, hypocrisy. Because everything he did from the rest of the night, uh, nothing resembled a Christ follower. The guy got wasted from the the crew joking to the the sexual in your windows. It goes on and on. And what he really meant was, I like to play both sides of the field. God doesn't play both sides of the field and he makes it very clear in his word. He wants us to be devoted to him. Him. You know, many of us, many of you guys are pretty stubborn. (laughs) Uh, 
<laughs> you won't listen to what your spouse tells you. Some of you won't listen to what your pastor <laughs> tells you. What are you laughing at? <laughs> Israel was very stubborn. <laughs> if we're going to be stubborn about something, let's be stubborn about God. Let's be stubborn in our resolve. You know, we, we, we're, we're so resolved in our, in our sin because we don't want to budge because when, it's, when, when light shines on it, it makes us angry. It makes us upset and we harden our hearts. How about we be stubborn in our resolve to follow Jesus? David says in Psalm 73, 25, he says, Whom have I in heaven but you? There is nothing on earth that I desire but you. Can you say that? There is nothing on earth, God, that I desire but you. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. How does that play out? God tells Israel, he says, these commandments are to be on your heart. Uh, he says that they, which this is passed along to us, we are to impress them on your children, to uh, teach diligently to. That, that, that word, if, if your translation says teach diligently to, that's really like one Hebrew word. So actually the NIV with that word impress, it kind of <laughs> shortens it down into to one word. And, and uh, that, that carries with it the connotation of, of, of a piercing or, or stimulating. So uh, entice it in your children, st stimulate it. You see what I mean? Pierce it uh, upon your, your children and press it upon them. How do, we, how do we do that? How do we impress it upon our, our children? It's a way that we live for God. Dropping your kids off at church isn't, isn't going to do it. Coming to church for your children. I've heard many of people say, well, I'm going to church for my children. That's not going to do it. Going to church for your kids is not going to do it. It has to be a part of you. It has to be apart from you. It has to be an attitude of do as I say, do as I do. Not a do as I say, don't do as I do. Because our children see our hypocrisy. They see it in us. They're watching us. And if we say we love Jesus, and that's not evident in our lives, they're going to see that. You understand? We can't say this is good for you, but not for me. That's messed up. It's good for you because it's good for me. Watch me as I follow Jesus. Even when I mess up and, and I repent and I confess it to you, watch me as I follow Jesus. And I'm not perfect, but on my heart, I want, to, I want to live for God. Impress it upon your, your children, he says to Israel. God says, uh, talk of these uh, commandments when you sit down. When you walk, when you lie down, when you get up, what's that mean? It's kind of like the, the heart, soul, mind, and strength. It's like in everything you do, let, let Jesus be on your lips. Hebrews 13, 15, through him, through Jesus, then let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God. That is this, the fruit of lips that acknowledge his name. Let us acknowledge God in everything that we do. It's a lie to say that we can't have, that we can have too much Jesus. You can be overbearing for other reasons. I mean, you can be beating people over the head with the Bible. You know what I mean? You can be that annoying Christian. But if you're annoying just because you love God and it just comes out naturally because you bleed God's word, you know what I mean? Don't let anybody tell you otherwise. Because the people that I have seen through life who, who do that, who are turned off, Christians that are turned off by too much God, 
there's some point where their faith and their walk usually wanes. Don't follow after that. Don't believe those lies. Tie them. Bind them. Write them on your hands. God says on your foreheads, on your door frames, and on your gates. What's he mean by that? You ever seen an ultra-Orthodox Jew? Any of you ever seen that? I got a picture for you. That's a, a, an Orthodox, I'll say even ultra-Orthodox. Most Orthodox Jews look like that to an extent, but then the ultra-Orthodox, you see the box on his head? It's because he took this passage literally. And so in that box is, is the law. <laughs> it's God's commandments are in that, that box, and you can't see it here, but it's also bound to his hand as well. But that's, that's not what, what, what God means. What, is, what does God mean? He, he says he wants you to uh, be so consumed with, with, with the goal, right? So single-minded that it saturates your, your life. It's in your thoughts. You see, bind it on your head. It's in your actions. Bind it on your, your arms. It's in everything that you do. That's what he means. The door frames and gates. Your, your home, is, 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 as Joshua said, uh, you go and do what you want to do. But his resolve is single-mindedness. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Have you made that resolution? For you and your household. And Christians can do this as, as well. We can do all the churchy things, right? We can attend church and some even like to carry our Bibles around. And we like to, just like the Pharisees, we, our prayers, we love to be heard. In the, <laughs> we like people to see us, you know? The selfie with our Bible study. I'm not, not saying that's always wrong. It's, 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 it's a heart issue, but we can do the same thing. God is looking inside of us, and that's what he means here. That's what he means here. So how do we put this into practice, this, this tying uh, it on our hands, this, this binding it to our, our foreheads, and this writing uh, God's word on the door frames and, and gates? It starts with creating uh, an environment, uh, an environment, like at work. You ever had to get organized, right? You get focused on work, and, and first thing they tell you to do is, is to clean off your desk. Clean off your desk. Get it, get it clean. Let's start with the clean slate. Like, the best way to clean out a garage, like, I'll go in there and start, like, trying to move things around. And my wife, she's so much better of an organizer than I am. She comes in and, like, in five minutes has everything out on the driveway. And I'm like, oh, okay, I get it now. <laughs> then it's like much easier to put things in order. You want to get your life in order? Don't start moving things around. It starts with repentance. Clean slate. Come before God. God, I have I've messed up. Repent. Clean slate. And then move forward. Repentance isn't confession. Repentance involves the intention of the heart. And intention is powerful. We can confess things to God and move on. Repentance is a change of heart. If you just confess something, that's not going to change something without a heart of repentance. A heart of repentance is when your desire changes. You see what I mean? Intention is powerful. The intention of the heart is powerful. And then, you got the clean slate. What a gracious God we have. Remove the barriers in your life. Suppose you're trying to, to uh, quit smoking. What should you do? <laughs> well, the first thing is to create a smoke-free environment. To get rid of all the junk that's going to be a temptation. Get rid of all the ashtrays, you know? You might not want to be hanging out in the, in the smoky bars and in places that are going to entice you to start smoking again. You see what I'm saying? It's the, same, it's the same way with God. We need to uproot things in our lives that are pulling us away from God. So let me ask you, what's tripping you up? 
Holy Spirit, impress it on our minds and our hearts right now. Bring it to our attention. What is tripping us up? What is keeping us from God? And don't ignore it. Don't push it down. Don't harden your hearts. God is speaking to you right now. In the name of Jesus, deal with it. Because if you keep hardening your hearts, there's going to be a time like Pharaoh that it's going to be rock solid. I can't predict it. I can't tell you when. But do not, if you hear his word today, do not harden your hearts as they did in the wilderness of God and they wandered for 40 years. Amen. (laughs) And then intentionally, Set steps and goals in following after Jesus. John Piper says, The rich fruit of spontaneity grows in the garden that is well tended by the discipline of schedule. Actually, Doug says something very similar, but John Piper is much more eloquent. <laughs> I'm kidding, Doug. But we want, we want a spontaneous life, right? Especially if, you, if you've tasted Jesus, you know it's organic. Because we follow a living God. It's not a, a Bible, you know, just a written words on a page that's like, do this, don't do that. It's not religion. We say it's what? A relationship. And that's a real person that we walk with. And it's a real Holy Spirit in, inside of us. That doesn't take away uh, order. It doesn't take away spiritual disciplines. You see, we still have to be disciplined. We still have to create time, as Doug said this morning, to be with God, to open his word and learn from him, to sit at his feet and let him speak to us. If we don't do it, it won't happen. And then when you do that, when you set a time uh, aside a time, not legalistically, but you set aside a time to be uh, intimate with God, to be with Him, and you learn from Him, then spontaneity happens. When you're walking with God, you have a word for somebody. You have discernment to go here or go there or obey God in this or speak to that person in this way. You see what I'm saying? Intentionally set steps. Find a way to spend time with God in prayer and in His Word and learn from Him and grow in Him and let that Bible read you. God is calling you to stop being a fan of Jesus and to start being a follower of Jesus. We have too many fans. He's asking for followers, people who will run after him, people who will leave their fishing nets and leave their boats and go after him. We might not be the most popular with our family members, with our coworkers, with our friends, but we got to be okay with that. Are you okay with that? Are you okay with leaving everything behind? Jesus said, in all the words of, of uh, uh, my burden is light, he said, count the cost when you follow me. Count the cost. Are you willing to leave everything and come after me? David, David Bowie. Um, many, if, if you know who he is, I think probably even those who aren't a fan of, of uh, his work knew that he, he, uh, he passed away recently, he died uh, recently. David Bowie was um, devoted and single-minded to his craft as an artist. Uh, whether you like him or, or not, he was pretty flamboyant. Uh, he, in fact, he's the one who inspired uh, uh, glam, uh, glam rock, and so that involved... You know, some cross-dressing and some, some crazy stuff as well. But he, he was an artist. And he was devoted to that artistry. And he inspired lots of people. He inspired lots of musicians in their craft because of his single-mindedness to what he did. But one thing that 
David Bowie failed to be single-minded about was the thing he needed to be devoted to the most. When asked about his faith, he said, for a while, uh, I followed Tibetan Buddhism, and that didn't really work. And then I followed after uh, uh, Nietzsche. Nietzsche? Is that how you say it? Nietzsche. Nietzsche. Yeah, actually, I think it's Nietzsche. Uh, I, I did a, uh, I did a, uh, a sound off to practice that name, and I think it, I've always said Nietzsche, too. Nietzsche, Nietzsche. I followed Satanism. I had a, a bout with Christianity. And none of them ever seemed to work. So he went through life just kind of wandering, never really seeking and, and finding. Let me ask you this morning, have you set your sights on Jesus? Have you found what you're looking for in Jesus Christ? Let me set you free to do what God says, to follow Him with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Let me, let me set you free to follow Jesus. Because the truth is, is you can't love Jesus like this. You can't love God the Father like this. With all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. If you're sitting there thinking, I have done that. <clears throat> <laughs> We're making some of the mistakes of the people that Jesus encountered in his day. You can't do it. You can't do it all the time. You can't do it 24-7. I doubt you can even do it just right now in your fallenness and, and, and your brokenness. And here's the thing. Just like American Ninja Warrior, you fall, you mess up, you're out. God doesn't, God doesn't play with sin at all. The good news, this is where it gets good. And this is where if you've been asleep the, up until now, you need to wake up. <laughs> Any demand that God makes, and he makes demands, they're not suggestions, they're not wishes, I even use the word desires in a sense. They're not even desires. They are demands. They are commands that he expects us to do. And when he says to love him with all of our heart, all of our soul, all of our mind, and all of our strength, and to be saturated in him, he means business. But any demand that God makes, he already met in Jesus Christ. Everywhere that we have failed, Jesus came to earth and loved God, his Father, with all of his heart, with all of his soul, with all of his mind, with all of his strength. He became the unblemished lamb, and then he took all of our junk, all of our sins, all of our imperfections, all of our failures, all the ways we follow God, and he hung it on the cross and himself. God punished that sin and dealt with that sin that anybody who would call upon the name of Jesus as Lord would be saved not as our works and our good deeds and our righteousness but by His righteousness alone. And then Paul says in 2 Corinthians 3, he says, but when one turns to the Lord, so when you turn to the Lord, there is a veil that is removed. What is that veil? That veil is everything that keeps us from following God like we ought to. And he says, when we turn to the Lord, when we call upon the Lord, when we repent, when we say that Jesus is Lord, you are Savior, that veil is removed. And then Paul says, now the Lord is Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Whew. 
And we all, if you have done that, if you've called upon the name of the Lord Jesus, and we all, with unveiled face, listen to that, child of God, unveiled face, the barrier has been removed, beholding the glory of God or being transformed into the same image of Jesus from one degree of glory to another. And listen to this. For this comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. Oh, that's good. That's good. You know what this is saying? He does it all. Trust Jesus. He does it all. Trust Jesus. Abide in me, Jesus says. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Our job is to abide. When I'm calling you to be single-minded, when I'm calling you to devote, I am calling you to abide. Because it is even God that he, he not only did the work for us, He is doing the work in us. But our job is to abide. Not to grieve the Holy Spirit, which Paul points out it is very possible to do when we ignore the work of God in us. God has set you free to live for Him. Only through Jesus can we be set free to love God. It's the only way. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. Through Jesus, we are set free to love God the way that we should. But unlike the TV show, right, as God's warriors, when we mess up, we get to get back up again. <laughs> We're not disqualified. We fall in that water, climb back up and get going again. That's the beauty of the gospel. But there is a goal to be moving toward. We are running a race. We have a, a, a mission. And Jesus is our goal. And he is what we are running towards. Keep your eyes on him. But get this. We love him. We love God. Because he first loved us. <laughs> that sparked something in us. We love God because he sent Jesus for us. Because he sent his Holy Spirit in us and quickened something and awoke something in us. And we see God for who he truly is. Not this overbearing dictator, but that God is love. And his desire is for us to be saved. And his desire for us is to walk in relationship with him and see the beauty of his glory and to walk with him forever. To be a part of his great and glorious kingdom. And to be at peace and to have joy. Are you single-mindedly running towards that goal? Are you going to be a fan? Or will you be a follower? If you don't know Jesus, today is the day of salvation. And I don't pretend to know everybody, you know, we're in a small church. I don't pretend to know that everybody knows Christ. I'm telling you, don't harden your hearts anymore. Surrender to God through Jesus Christ. It really is that simple. And he's promised us that he'll save us. You see, we don't start with loving God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength and say, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this. It starts with submitting our lives to Christ, to accepting his his grace. And you can do that as simply as this. Father, Lord, I am full of sin. I realize that I have not loved you with all my heart, all my soul, all my mind, and all my strength. I realize that it is impossible for me. I realize that I've failed time and time again. I've ignored you. I've rebelled you, God. But thank you so much for loving me despite that, for counting me worthy for sending Jesus, if for only me, God. So I thank you for the gift of Christ, that he is Lord of all, Lord. And I position myself under his reign. 
Thank you for saving me. Thank you for your grace. In Jesus' name, amen. If you believe that Jesus is Lord, the Bible promises you that you will be saved.